So Marco, thanks for joining us again. Welcome to the show once more. Thank you, Neil. So in the first uh, bit, we had a general introduction to Dante uh, from our own, of course, uh, special uh, dissident uh, point of view. People can listen mm. to that. Um, so I would like to continue to continue our descent into hell. Uh, we talked about how mm. Dante meets uh, Virgil, the great poet, and Virgil guides him physically, metaphorically, po poetically down into hell. And there's a place there called limbo, uh, which has become an expression that we say, uh, I'm stuck in limbo. Uh, the mm. pagans were stuck in limbo. Aristotle is there. Homer is there. Plato is there. Mm. And Virgil himself is there. And we mm. analyzed what that means in the first episode, so perhaps we shouldn't mm. go over it again. Uh, but then they continue down into the, uh, the real hell, if you will. Yes. And at the crossing, at the gate... Uh, Dante, led by Virgil, encounters Minos, which immediately caught my attention uh, as my YouTube channel, Ancient Greece Revisited, of which this mm. show is an offshoot, uh, deals almost exclusively with the thought, the myths, the mysticism, the religion, the, the, the imaginary of ancient Greece. And Minos uh, had a very interesting position because he was a mythical king. He was the king of Crete. Uh, a mythical person. He's very m well remembered for a monster, mm -hmm. the Minotaur, meaning bull of Minos, uh, who was an abomination created by his lustful wife, Pasiphae, as she slept with an actual bull and created this monster, the, the bull of Minos. Mm -hmm. Uh, but Minos was much more than that. Um, for the ancient Greek imaginary, Minos was a great lawgiver. Um, he's mentioned by Plato on, on a dialogue called Minos. And he's mentioned in Plato's laws ag again. And yes, that was a good Minos. Yes, and, and, and the le legend has it that even Lycurgos, who was the lawgiver of Sparta, uh, a historical figure, or quasi, um, mm -hmm. studied under Minos. Minos was almost like a link with God, with the, the, the divine, uh, as if he was the first to receive the law, like Moses did in the Bible. Minos, in the ancient Greek imaginary, took the laws, the perfect laws, from Zeus. And so, thousands of years later, in this great epic Dante's comedy, Minos is not much of a lawgiver. He is a monster figure that's guarding the entrance of hell proper. Okay, so what do we mm. make of that image? Mm. Mm. Well, as I understand, uh, there is a, there's an agreement that there are two Minos, uh, the good one, perhaps the grandson, however you, was bad one, um, however you want to put it. Uh, he was, the good one was um, set there as judge of the dead. That's fine. Um, Dante uh, enjoys, he has a ball with using um, and in fact reviving um, the personage, the characters of the classical imagination and um, uh, restoring them to our present imagination. Present, Within, as in the uh, Christian of his time. Uh, yes, well, his, his contemporary imagination, and in fact, for us too, yeah, and for future generations, um, mm. in a poetic context, his context. So why does Minos in the Christian world occupies this particular place? Well, uh, there there are reasons for various people, but uh, clearly the Christians um, uh, perform a similar intervention. Uh, they bring the characters of classical antiquity, um, myths, Apollo, and so forth, um, within the new context. So the old Apollo is now a new Apollo, who is Christ. The old Hercules, well, same story. Um, the old kings 
uh, that, that survived in the popular imagination are now, um, they're, well, they're dead, but they're restored in the underworld. And so the great king, it's, it's only fair for him to be um, now a king of the, of the dead. Hmm. Now, what, what is important is not so much what uh, Dante's contemporaries were doing with these old characters, with these uh, models of classical antiquity. What is important here is to see what Dante is up to. And we see the um, Dante's Minos in, uh, portrayed in, uh, of course, uh, uh, most uh, famously, perhaps, in Michelangelo's Last Judgment in the Sistine Chapel, where he is there again. He has the appearance, as we are told, of a high clergyman uh, whom uh, Michelangelo had a, a particular dislike for. And uh, what I think is crucial in Dante's treatment, however, and what what is really besides the point of what other people were uh, thinking about Minos, is that he has an action there. He is performing something. He's doing something that is telling us something of great importance. And this is usually missed. You see, uh, he is he is rapping, yeah? mm -hmm. the souls, and the rapping around yeah, of his, with his tail. Yeah? This is sort of a dragon's tail. Yes. Um, this, this wrapping around uh, is pointing to the actual structure of the underworld, of hell, the inferno. The wrapping is not, therefore, to be understood as simply flat, yeah? Mm -hmm. So that every time you wrap, you sort of, the tail sort of um, increases in circumference. On the contrary, it is tightening yeah, around. So you could think about it as a, as a spiral that tightens a spiral downward. coming in. Yes, or however, yeah. Uh, so so it's, it's um, every time he turns the tail, it's um, the, the, the circle that the tail uh, goes along becomes smaller and smaller. So if you and you know and and again this this follows not in fact if we read the passage carefully not a, some hidden logic but indeed uh, the appearances of things and it's related to the problem of determination. Let me explain this in a few words. Hell is a place where souls lose their logos, their reason, progressively into physical, shall we say, physical determinations. The mind is determining itself more and more until it reaches a single point. Yeah? It's, it's tightening itself more and more. It's determining itself into a uh, some kind of a fiction, in fact, mm -hmm. a figment of the imagination. More and more until it reaches the bottom. Now, the bottom, it turns out, and we'll see this later perhaps in the course of our conversation, um, becomes something um, more than, than a determination. It becomes a, um, a passage to another dimension. Uh, indeed, it is represented by um, a Belzebu, uh, this this uh, Satan, who is utterly innocuous, um, incapable of harming anyone. He is so determined that he is frozen. Um, he is a monster, um, but he is a kind of caricature. Now, at the beginning with Minos, he is looking at the souls that appear to him. 
and they are incapable of speaking. They uh, yell, they shriek, um, they're not hiding anything. And so it is enough for him to see these souls to determine precisely where they stand within hell. Hmm. He doesn't ask him any questions. They empty themselves out. In fact, they say that as soon as they appear, they can't help before Minos. They cannot help but uh, confessing themselves entirely, entirely to him mm -hmm. without speaking. Mm -hmm. Their appearance speaks. In other words, they speak, uh, they empty their rationality, if you like, their speech within appearance. So they have determined themselves, and they're actually punishing themselves. And he's just there to, uh, you know, uh, confirm what their actual what their appearance is actually saying. Mm -hmm. uh, so you want to determine yourself that way? Okay, here you go, and you go on that level. Uh, mm -hmm. That's primarily his job. So what this is telling us uh, is that space, space is a function. Of something um, of, that is not of a, of a material order, uh, that judgment um, is um, primary, and space is a reflection. The, so the geography of hell is a reflection of of a judgment, mm -hmm. uh, which is a determination of mind, as all judgments are. Uh, indeed, they're defined. People are actually defining themselves uh, w and, and shaping their, the, the place they're in. Uh, and indeed, the, the whole structure of hell is a, the structure of the mind's determinations, mm -hmm. or de the way the mind determines itself until it reaches a point where it's one point, literally one point. And the term point appears at the, uh, in this canto, and it will appear, it has appeared, in the first canto of Inferno, where Dante tells us that he does not, he cannot say well, he cannot tell us well, you know, so ben ridir come vi intrai, tante rapiendi sonno a quel punto, and the punto is not um, there by accident, he has a punto, a point, again here and elsewhere in Inferno, uh, which suggests that there is a point through which, a little door, if you like, uh, through which you enter into a dimension. In the beginning of Inferno, it is a question of entering into a dreamlike world of determinations. And you will see that people throughout uh, the souls, anybody he, he meets, throughout Inferno, will be afraid, will be scared, as we all know. But what are they scared of? They're not scared of what Dante is scared of. At the beginning of Inferno, Dante is scared of monsters, determinations. People in Inferno will be um, scared of indetermination the loss of determination, the loss of certainties, if you like, which are fictive. They are illusions. Mm -hmm. um, Dante is not afraid of indetermination, of uncertainty. Indeed, the, the question of uncertainty is stressed in the first canto, where he meets Virgil, who is, uh, we can deduce, he is not uh, an homo certo, as he calls him, a certain man. He is uncertain. He is undetermined. So we call him the ghost of the, the phantom or whatever sh shadow. Um, he is a man who once was and who now is in a poetic context. Bottom line, he stands for um, a virtue, a poetic virtue that is not determined and who lives freely uh, within indetermination. Mm -hmm. um, so Dante is, I stress this point because it's a point, it's, it's a very important to understand uh, Inferno. Dante is not afraid of what people, the people he meets are afraid of. They're afraid of precisely what he is doing and what he's following. 
And in this Canto uh, 5, where we find Minos, uh, Virgil rebukes the objection that Minos raises. Okay, so Minos is a, this is all a theater. Uh, it's a Shakespearean theater, if you like. Everything that, that Dante writes is a theater. And he rebukes uh, uh, Dante, uh, the pilgrim, warning him against the guidance that he has picked. Yeah? Poetry and Virgil uh, silences him. Um, there's a special way. He, he, he has this formula that he introduces here, and he will recur to it throughout uh, the Inferno with all objections that are raised against poetry. And people will say, oh, how dare you? What are you, what are you doing here? Uh, you're not supposed to be going upward by going downward, by the way. Um, you're not supposed to be doing what you're doing. And uh, Virgil says, no, no, there is somebody vouching for him. There is a, there is a will that is independent of power. Uh, you know, and we don't know exactly what it is. We, we assume that it's God's will that vouches for uh, Dante's poetic ascent, or in any case, journey. Mm -hmm. These people are afraid of poetry. These people are afraid of what is undetermined. Mm -hmm. They're couched in determinations mm. that's what they're all about and dante is there to expose the lie in these determinations or in any, or at any in any case at any rate to to show us that these determinations of the mind are justified only in a poetic context and so ironically too thus we have to understand that we are not meant to be stuck in these determinations but to go through them through them for the sake of rising to mm -hmm. into another world mm -hmm. and that will be purgatory by the way mm -hmm. wow and uh, it, that hollander will not tell you no <laughs> I, I know you're not very fond of this translation <laughs> and as uh, dante moves from that point on uh essentially yes. minos scatters the souls and they find their rightful place yeah in, well in yeah hell in not, not inferno <laughs> rightful for for the authorities now dante is not happy about that and uh, he he uh, uh, upsets these this um, uh, status quo as it were mm -hmm. he is constantly upsetting the the scene wherever he goes mm -hmm. this will happen also in purgatory he upsets the scene in fact in purgatory it comes to the point where people are waiting for him to upset the scene and he comes as an earthquake Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And uh, following his 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 route uh, yes. in, into hell, we we have this famous image of the rings of hell. Hell is presented as a ring-like structure, and I think you gave uh, an, an idea of what that would mean as reflected. I mean, I just saw that simile for the first time. That Minos' tail, which is like a serpent's and coils. Um, is like a mini inferno in many ways. Yes. It has the same yes. coil like structure. So it's, yeah, that image is very fitting to be almost in a fractal way to be in the beginning. Now, you know, you have a yes. miniature of, at the gates of something, you have a miniature version of that thing. Mm -hmm. and, and then each, um, each ring uh, represents a. A, a sin represents a, a certain yes. error and yeah. uh, the first one there is lust um, yeah. and we have this image that we analyzed in the previous episode of uh, Paolo and Francesca who are the two lustful yeah. uh, lovers yeah. uh, mm. and then, yes, well, and then yes. you, you, you go into gluttony uh, avarice mm -hmm. and uh, you meet another, uh, you meet another mythical figure, which is uh, Plutus, which it was mm -hmm. the god of wealth for ancient Greeks, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and now wealth uh, and the accumulation, of course. And it's a very harsh image that Dante gives for this god, Greek god Plutus, as he finds him mm -hmm. in Canto mm -hmm. Seven. Uh, Plutus mm -hmm. is kind of half mumbling words that are still <laughs> not very well mm -hmm. understood. He says something like Pope Satan, Pope Satan um, <laughs> uh, burst out Plutus in his raucous mm -hmm. voice. 
mm-hmm. and the courteous, all discerning yes. sage, that is Virgil, mm-hmm. to comfort me said, do not be overcome by fear, however powerful he may be. He'll yes. most prevent, he'll not prevent our climbing down this cliff. No kidding. And no, uh, no, he is, he is, he is a, look, everything is to be understood in the context of this a play. It is a play. Mm. When we read Shakespeare again, mm. it, it, we know it's a stage. Uh, there is a stage, and there is a lot of irony. People in translation, it's very difficult, very often to mm. to uh, discern. This is um, he tells us. This you know, you you need poetry to think and discern, uh, to better think and discern. Says in the first canto again, uh, Virgil. Uh, he's the here. It, it is only in the poetic, Virgilian poetic context that you can understand. And so therefore, in, in the context of poetry, they, you can understand all these characters, all these images of the imagination, of the popular imagination. Of, you know, everything in the whole world we live in has to be understand, understood uh, in a poetic, or how do you understand poetry, in a Virgilian uh, sense, as a stage, as a theatrical stage otherwise you miss the point otherwise you fall prey to fear you start fearing determinations um and uh, just to as move, he as he does at the beginning just to move quickly to an application um you know it's, yes. it's no secret that this show that we're on um started as a i i often say as as a gut response to to what's happening mm. to the world after the pandemic with the circus or with it without co- quotes yeah um, and 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 you know that 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 tyranny that's been rising this medical tyranny that's been rising mm-hmm. uh, how can we see this as a play yes well um uh, this this uh, and who are the characters <laughs> um uh, dante's inferno is a world in which we spiral further and further into um, a determination. single point. We, we, yes, yes, we determine ourselves. By the way, you mentioned uh, Paolo and Francesca, and that too is about spiraling. Uh, because, because they're flying in the air. Uh, uh, love, she says that she was reading, you know, uh, Francesca was reading about Lancelot and Lancelot a romance uh, yes and she refers to his we could say in translation um, love strangling him uh, stranger is the but that is mm-hmm. the same root as strangle um, and, and in fact it is refer it, it appears the term appears in that sense he was basically strangled and at one Point and she mm. he, she comes up with the, the this term the basically the the image at one at uh, one point they kiss right? and at this one point they pull back and my goodness what did they do they had a little kiss you know and you know perhaps out of a poetic context one might wonder why in the world would they deserve to go to hell for a mm. little kiss. <laughs> Just in the even, uh, you know, imitated mm. the the guy in the book, um, is the one point, the one determination where, in that particular case, love uh, faces itself. It turns out that this Paolo is not even alive there. He, I mean, he's not, he's not even speaking there. Mm. He 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 merely cries as an echo to her voice. Mm. He doesn't really see him. Um, she could be, he could be, um, very easily. Um, a mirror anyone of it could be her anyone. love a mirror of her love mm. um, so the strangling has to do with love a corruption of love love in love with itself uh. love determined and that um, misses a big problem which is gr- this is all important for Virgil um, for Virgil of course for Dante the problem of virtue mm. virtue treads in indetermination you know, when you're in trouble, I mean, you have to, nobody, you can read as many books as you want, telling you what to do. But when you're in trouble, 
If you're a boxer, you need to fight. You need to face the unexpected, the undetermined. Mm. You can't just rely on what you have learned. You have to face, and if you're, good, if you're a good fighter, you have to have a, a face the undetermination of life. And this is all important for, for Dante. And this is what relates uh, to what the, the, the problem you raised. Yeah? Mm. For indeed, Dante is not satisfied with people um, defining your place in life. Finding uh, a niche for you to, to abide in, um, defining you, therefore, um, without need for, well, what is all important for, for Dante, namely virtue. Virtue is out of the window in hell. Nobody cares about it. Why? Because they don't need it. Why do you need virtue that deals with un the undetermined life when you have already been determined? So it's like it's the people in Your hell, place has been determined. You know, people in inferno, they're, they're stuck there. Uh, and I know I'm paraphrasing a lot, but to use like Jungian terminology, they're, they're being overrun by a single archetype, in a sense, whether that is lust, whether that is anger, whether that is uh, some compulsion in some way. I mean, he's Dante's integrating, integrating uh, the whole universe mm. of our linguistic imagination in his uh, in his world, in this on the on this stage, on this theatrical stage. Everything is brought in, so you will see uh, the the loftiest of uh, theological uh, speculations. Name it, and of course you will see the popular language. You will see the, all kinds of uh, colleagues uh, echoed in his poem. Bring it in; uh, it's it's wonderful. It uh, it uh, helps people relate to what is happening in in the poem, and it helps um, the case that that Dante is there to make, namely that. There is, and there has been, a drive to abandon the capacity that is proper to the human being as such, to the anthropos, to deal face-to-face, mm -hmm. -face, if you like, with indetermination. That capacity is called virtue. It has been abandoned in the name of an authority that is out to determine everyone, to mm, cast everyone to the ground, and to prevent any ascent, any virtues, ascent to the good. There is no poetic ascent to the good. That has been abolished, banned, damned as evil, as unjust. What is our task as human beings now is to be determined to determine ourselves and be determined by the authorities in our own place. Mm. And the, the more we're determined and the more, you know, we find ourselves closer to Satan, of course, <laughs> for that, yeah. uh, who is the ultimate determination. You want to be determined, he says, fine. The ultimate determination is the ultimate betrayal of virtue. The ultimate betrayal, you're going to be the worst of traitors. Mm -hmm. um, and and he, he likens that to, the, to Judah, uh, to the ancient betrayals, mm -hmm. betrayal in classical antiquity. And you are betraying you, yes. your own mandate as a human being, which is to ascend to the good. And you do that the way he does it. Well, it's, and b before we, we rush to the end... Um, Mm. Uh, Dante keeps on descending. Uh, there's a river there that he passes called Styx, another element mm. of a uh, from ancient Greece. Mm. And he says, mm. the water was darker than the deepest purple, accompanied by its murky waves. We began our strange descent. The dreary stream, once it has reached these malignant 
ashen slopes drains mm -hmm. out into the swamp called Styx. Mm -hmm. And Dante crosses this uh, ancient Greek river of the dead. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. there's another threshold there that I want to ask you about because mm -hmm. Virgil, although it's clear that his place is not in deep hell, let's say, it's in limbo, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. where, as the poet says, uh, the only penalty is hope cut off. Okay, the only penalty in limbo is the absence of hope. There's no further suffering. There's no flames consuming you. There's no devils pricking you with their s mm -hmm. spears. Mm -hmm. that, um, but mm -hmm. throughout this journey, Virgil proves to be a very capable guide, uh, poetically. Oh, yes. And of course, we know that Virgil wrote uh, the Ennead, uh, where he also imagines an, his hero descending into hell. So it's like. Uh, it's almost like he's practiced <laughs> poetically to do that. But there's one point just after mm -hmm. Styx where Virgil seems unsure of himself, where mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. perhaps it's the greatest terror. It's, it's, it's almost when you're a little child and whoever your father is, you just have this blind faith. And the, the scariest thing is seeing him being afraid of something because then mm -hmm. you're lost. You're like, you know, mm -hmm. I'm a little child. I'm scared of everything and, mm -hmm. and not at the same time. But if my father is scared, oh, my God, you know. Mm -hmm. And that's the, in, in Canto 9 after they cross sticks. Um, mm -hmm. And Dante says, the, uh, the pallor cowardice painted on my face when I saw my leader turning back made him mm -hmm. hasten to compose his features. He stopped mm -hmm. like a man intent mm -hmm. on listening for the mm -hmm. eye could not probe far through that dim air and murky fog. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and there's a point where even Virgil is unsure. And, and, and mm -hmm. after that it never comes back, this point. Virgil mm -hmm. is mm -hmm. a faithful and quite certain companion up until he, in at the end of uh, purgatory, he just naturally, he's kind of shed off like skin. But th that mm -hmm. moment of near failure, what does it tell us? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, this is, you're referring to Canto 9, right? Yes. Uh, where he also uh, encounters the heretics. Yes. Um, hmm. Uh, down, uh, Virgil will be or will appear uncertain on various occasions uh, throughout the underworld and the reason for that is quite simple he's used to his own underworld he's used to dealing with uh, the creatures on the underworld as the good old pagan he was with the understanding that all the creatures that he sees there are poetic entities. They are to be understood in a poetic context. However, not all of the creatures and the difficulties that he encounters throughout the Inferno are simply pagan. There are new things. Mm. Um, we know what has happened in the meantime. There has been a Christian revolution, and there are novelties. There are <laughs> There are innovations, mm. and not, therefore, all that he encounters responds as uh, he, he expects, expects it yes. to, to respond. That's why sometimes he recurs to uh, special uh, formulas, such mm. as the appeal to this higher will. Uh, so let him pass, and so forth. Now, th that problem uh, may very well be exacerbated here because we're dealing with heretics, and, well, um, we know that uh, from the first canti, that um, uh, already in the first one, that, uh, that Virgil speaks of himself as, and presents himself as somebody who has rebelled against the Lord of the universe. Now, how in the world could he have ever rebelled to somebody he didn't know? Mm. Um, now, of course, how could he be even speaking about somebody who, whom he doesn't know? Um, not um, everything that 
Virgil does is to be taken, and perhaps nothing is to be taken face value. Sometimes he postures. Mm. He will posture later, and he postures in response to Dante's, of course, the poet's um, interests. Dante is playing with his characters. Dante the poet, yeah? But uh, he, he's playing with us, and he, if he wants to show someone, you know, Virgil to be afraid, uh, you know, he has his point. You have to go through close readings, and then you say, ah, that is the point. So don't and ever take anything face value with Dante. This is the, the, the perhaps the most important uh, um, point, line yes. of guidance, line of guidance for any reader. Uh, you know, there is a a stage it's a theatrical stage where you you go from one passage to another and they all mirror each other and you begin to see to see to ascend to the good to the meaning to climb out of determination say oh but i thought he was but wait a second is he ironic what is he trying to do what is virgil trying to do what is dante trying to do with virgil um, and and you know, very often we'll, we'd be surprised to find out. Very surprised. Mm -hmm. It can be counterintuitive. Mm -hmm. And uh, th th there's one thing that I was just um, struck immediately when I was reading uh, uh, this great book, right? Um, like we mentioned, uh, hell is, is kind of an organized place. Uh, it's structured. Mm. Overdetermined. Overdetermined. It's structured. It coils itself inwards and a, every mm. ring represents a, a, a sin, a failing, uh, an error perhaps would be the, uh, the proper term. And so you see uh, Dante's uh, kind of hierarchy of, of sin, of error, and it's very different from our hierarchy. You know, uh, if you would ask a, just a random person on the street uh, to kind of put, you know, um, the, the bad things that someone can do, put them in order of lesser to greater, you know, what's the absolute mm -hmm. worst some, someone can do, the absolute evil and the lesser evil. Mm -hmm. Perhaps, you know, nowadays they would put on the top, top, top of the pyramid, they put something like... Um, uh, child molestation, um, <laughs> and then underneath mm. they would put uh, violence against women, and then mm. underneath perhaps, and ah. you, you know that makes a lot of sense. But I fear that after that things are getting murky, and I fear that a lot of people are going to have uh, homophobia, Islamophobia, somewhere there, <sighs> very very high on the hierarchy of uh, mm. sin, you mm. know, and maybe mm. something mm. like lying would be just at the bottom bottom it's no big deal after all but that's not dante's hierarchy that's not dante's world and as we move into inferno um i was surprised to find that violence um yes active violence killing someone is not at the top of the pyramid it's kind of in the middle um no yeah and no. as you move inwards i was very surprised and this is the point that i want to touch to find that near the top of the pyramid and actually at the top but even as you're nearing the ultimate sin for dante is how can we call it forgery falsification it's not betrayed. lying in the uh, you know, I'm late, so I'm going to pretend I had a flat tire. Although this, I'm sure, mm. what was grave enough for him. But corrupting the truth. Um, just to give an example, simony, mm. which is the mm. act of forgery, essentially, mm. uh, is mm. very high up, you know, forging the, the, the currency. Uh, forge. Even someone, I, I don't remember the name, I have the book in front of me, but I don't have the exact point, I can't find it now. But you might remember, there's someone almost like a stand-up comedian of his time, of Dante's time, that's put mm. right there very deep into hell for mm. aping, I think, for mimicking, aping like a monkey, like an ape, for aping other people. Uh, mm. l a mimic is, yeah, is, is, is mm -hmm. placed there. Um, yeah. What do we make of this hierarchy, this, for mm. us, for modern man, very strange hierarchy of sin? Well, uh, in simple terms, 
one can see that uh, the lesser the lesser crime as it were is um, one that does not involve commitment to it so you will have the lust at the beginning and that's not that bad because it does not involve um, a an active will um, rejection mm. of the good yeah? it, you it's let yourself being be dragged away. Yeah, yes you're away. dragged like and you can see this in the yeah exactly and you have these actually you have these scenes this imagery of crowds that are uh, blown by by a wind in the vortex yes again a vortex that determines them as dead leaves in the wind so okay that's bad enough yeah but then then you can move to um, a more dire condition where you're yeah you're you're a um, vandal as it were you're an active you participant will, you are um, violently turning towards the good and uh, the good here again for Dante in a poetic context you're violently turning against the whole life of poetry of a poetry and of poets so the whole of, shall we say the the very mandate of man as man for, for for Dante which is the ascent the poetic ascent to the good you're rejecting that you're not only abandoning it as Pinocchio might abandon you know the the his counsel to, he had, no, he has, you know, to, to, he was told to go to school and he lets himself be dragged away by the cat and the fox and he goes to li goes listens to the marionette show okay that was pretty bad but hey uh, he just he was just vulnerable he okay now he violently tries to hit the um, in fact kill the um, what was that the grasshopper who was uh, advising him to return to his father to listen to his father because his father was not there as a tyrant he was there as a good guy to save him from uh, hell uh, so he violently turns with um, uh, resentment with resentment against poets against good poetic advice now what is worse than that? What is worse than that is trying to replace poetry with an imposture. Replace completely the ascent to the good with a descent Can I, I into ju just ask you evil. Speak, just a, li a little oh, louder. Yes, louder. Yes. So yes. The, the worst is to try to replace the ascent to the good with a descent into evil mm. okay now that is just about the worst you can do not only have you let yourself go into you know stupidity and and uh, viciousness or you know just let yourself be duped by uh, you know by merchants who are mercenaries who just want to make use of you for their own purposes not only have you made a fool of yourself not only have you then in order to cover up your stupidity your fault you have turned against poetry to attack it and you you can see this for instance in Botticelli's calumny of um, Apelle uh, where the the painter is dragged by his hair uh, by all these uh, these vicious uh, slanderous characters to the to the uh, throne of a king who has donkey ears and again I, I want to stress that Botticelli was a very keen student of Dante so not only do you turn against poetry and all that is wholesome virtue poetic virtue uh, hold all that is wholesome in man with violence trying to attack it to stone that 
man of virtue as being an impious, as being uh, somebody who is against the grain, somebody who is questioning the status quo, the determinations of our world. Now, you want to do more than that. You want to replace that. You want to give a, a, a replacement of virtue. What else are we going to have? In its stead, we're going to um, usurp its poetic throne. We're going to replace its Parnassus, the hill of, of poetry, with something else, perhaps a Tower of Babel. Uh, we want to replace it with a Tower of Determinations. Now, Tower of Determinations that leads straight to Belzebub for Dante, because he has had enough of that Tower of Babel. He gives it to us upside down, and he shows that the further up you go, the further down you go, you, the further the, you approach the um, frozen and inept, utterly inept status of Belzebub. Mm -hmm. Now notice that Belzebub, his Satan, is never called Lucifer. Mm. And the reason for this is that, and we, we will find that confirmed in Purgatorio, Purgatory, is that for the poet, Lucifer is the poet himself. He brings the light into the dark. Uh, so there is a, you know, uh, a, a kind of almost like ironic, a good, good, good devil and bad devil. Well, it, it's it's. Um, it's an ironic treatment of, of the term Lucifer that you find in Dante. If he ever mentions Lucifer, look carefully at the context, and we find out that, indeed, Lucifer is a misnomer for the devil. Um, or rather, for and, and he prefers, when he gets to the end of Inferno, he prefers Belzebu, which sounds... Um, uh, uglier for like sure a chimera like a chimera it's a it's a it's a funny also in a way it's a funny word it's in it's not something very credible it's, yeah, it's something from yeah yes but it, it, it's also kind of it's a monster mm. it's just a monster a monstrosity now the good news however is that this monster is so monstrous and so determined that he is incapable of harming us Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, and and before we reach to that final image, okay. um, there's one image that you know, as a student of Greek, um, I just had to pause. Yes, right there, near the core where the these falsifiers are, we found Odysseus, Ulysses, um, and there's an image Ulysses, of flames, yes. Ulysses. Mm -hmm. Um, where, where Ulysses is burning and uh, Ulysses is, you know, ironically, so he's the most typical resident of hell as most people imagine it, as a place that would you burn eternally, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, this is very image that has stayed to my m mind where Dante, mm -hmm. who throughout the poem is given permission to interrogate the souls, turns to mm -hmm. you, you, Odysseus and asks him his story, yes. essentially. And Odysseus says this, uh, says, uh, turns to Dante and says, his journey. Says, when I took leave of Circe, who for a year and more beguiled, beguiled me there, not far from Gaeta, that's a place in Spain, before Aeneas gave that name to it, not tenderness for a son, not fidelity, duty toward my aged father, nor the love I owed Penelope that would have made her glad could overcome the fervor that was mine to gain experience of the world and learn about man's vices and his worth. And so I set forth upon the open deep with but a single ship and that small band of shipmates who had not deserted me. One shore and the other I saw as far as Spain, Morocco, the island of Sardinia, and the other islands set into that sea. 
I and my shipmates had grown old and slow before we reached the narrow strait where Hercules marked off the limits, warning men to go no further. On the right-hand side I left Seville behind, and the other mm -hmm. I had left Ceuta. O oh, brothers, I said, who in the course of a hundred thousand perils at last have reached the west to such brief wakefulness of our sense as remains to us, do not deny yourself the chance to know, following the sun, the world where no one lives. Mm. So Odysseus is shown, did not really want to return to Ithaca at the moment where he was set free of Circe, the sorcerers, mm -hmm. and at the moment where he could finally turn his ship and do what Homer was claiming that Odysseus wanted the most, to return home. He mm -hmm. turns the other way for one final mm -hmm. journey, to know, to gain knowledge. He leaves everything behind, his beloved wife who was wa mm -hmm. waiting for him, his only son, his aged father, all mm -hmm. that he, for <coughs> knowledge, to, to go to America, we are told, to, to cross. It's amazing. Odysseus in America could have been the, tall, the title mm -hmm. of this canto, to cross the uh, gates of Hercules, which are still on the banner of Andalusia, whoever has traveled there, um, to cross the Atlantic Ocean and reach America. For what? For knowledge, he says, to know man's vices. Like, that mm -hmm. is a very powerful image. And the, it, Dante kind of curses him for that, curses him more than mm. the the killers of their brothers, more more than the the, the heretics. He's there. L like, how can we reconcile this image with our love, with my love for Odysseus? Uh, where do you see the curse? Uh, can you give me the verses, please? Well, he's burning. He's burning in the brightest Yeah, but flame. it's not... Uh, yeah, but this is not... Um, it's not that he curses him. Um, uh, I mean, Dante. Let, 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 let us be. Let, yeah, let us not be mistaken about this. We have places in the inferno, and we don't know, although we might believe, if only moved by prejudice. We don't know that everyone really deserves to be where they are. There is a reason mm -hmm. why they're there. There's a reason why they're there, but this reason is not all that evident. Or rather, it is not all that clear that this is good reason. Okay? So, there's another point that I believe I had referred to, I had raised in our earlier conversation. Namely, that wherever Dante speaks to someone in person, he is out there to somehow rid, somehow redeem that person and to show that he does not yeah, that, belong almost, there. Yes, that's okay. almost like a rule that you, you gave us on the last interview yeah. that whenever Dante yes. speaks to someone, that yes. person, it's, it's almost like a hint yeah. that that person is yeah. somehow redeem or redeemable. Redimo. He, he is showing us that he doesn't really deserve to be there at all. And that includes his, perhaps his, one of his, maybe his closest, most intimate teacher, um, but who is among, you know, hiding among the, the um, at some point, um, the um, a sodomist, um, although in his life he had a problem uh, being... Uh, accused of heresy. Uh, but now, uh, he meets poets. You know, uh, why in the world would they be in, in the underworld? Now, Ulysses, he, again, he uh, recycles <laughs> Ulysses. Now, we know that in a Christian sense, the journey to Ithaca can mean something other than a journey to his physical homeland, it can be a journey of the soul back to its uh, original place, yeah? to the good. Yeah? Now, uh, Ulysses 
is there. And what happens to him? He somehow takes, this is somewhat more or less ironic, yeah, but the flight of Icarus. Mm -hmm. Ulysses, yeah, references to Ulysses elliptical, or more or less indirect, uh, occur throughout the comedy. The journey of Ulysses is evoking somehow that of Dante. He takes this folle volo, the foolish flight. Now, what is foolish about, and by the, say, by the way, what happens to Ulysses after taking the foolish flight to, the, to, to, to wisdom? Well, very simply, he is swallowed by the waters. Now, so with his men, right? He is... Um, with his <laughs> remaining companions, yes. Yes, yes, with his the ship, the, the whole enterprise is swallowed by the waters. This also happens to other people, um, more or less metaphorically. Uh, Statius in Purgatory, Statius, is an example of this. He is not unlike, in fact, um, Ulysses. He is submerged. But there we are told that he is baptized. Now, secret of being baptized, perhaps. He's baptized, which uh, something that most modern interpreters, if not virtually everyone, has interpreted to mean that he converted. But Dante does not say that he was com that he converted willfully or consciously. He said that he was baptized. In other words, he became Christian willy nilly. Um, what has happened to many a character of classical antiquity that we know of? Um, they have been, we could say. They've been submerged by the waters of Christianity. In other words, uh, a lid has been placed upon their heads and upon their pursuits, upon everything they stood for. Now, Ulysses here is out to pursue wisdom. That seems to be now, under the water, a hubristic pursuit. Dante is redeeming that pursuit by showing its justice. Beyond the caricature of Icarus, who of course tried to fly too close to the sky, he became in love with it, and he forgot the prudence of his father, Dante shows that the flight, the so-called foolish flight, il folle volo, is in entirely redeemable, provided that we listen to Daedalus, the father, the architect. And indeed, at the end of uh, Paradiso, Dante will liken himself to the architect. And Dante is, of course, the architect of the comedy, obviously. Hmm. So, is it really foolish to pursue wisdom in this life? Well, it looks like it's not. But if we assume for a moment that, as happens more evidently throughout Purgatorio, the pursuit of the people uh, Dante meets on the way is picked up by Dante. As if Dante were to say, all right, what did you want to do? Tell me. And the guy tells him what he wants to do, what he what would have liked to do, what he was doing. And the only thing is that we have forgotten it's the whole point. And Dante says, okay, give me this. He, you know, it's sort of a relay. Give me your staff. Give me your mission. And I will carry it on, on my journey, beyond the limitations that you were, well, they were imposed upon you, okay, that you were forced to submit to.
at the very least, in our popular imagination. So, Ulysses is redeemed in Dante. Now, the funny thing you're familiar with is that Christianity redeems Apollo in the Christ, redeems everyone in the Christ, Ulysses. Um, I mean, it redeems, um, you know, uh, name it, Hercules. It redeems Zeus. And again, these are the characters that... Um, in the Commedia, in, yeah. yeah, in the Commedia, Christ will be apparently Christ is spoken of as Zeus, as Apollo, as Hercules. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, so now, it is not the Christ who redeems them in a in an ultimate context, sublime. It is Dante who is redeeming them in a poetic context which doesn't mean that he is replacing the Christ in an ultimate context. It's just that it's a different context. It's a more human <laughs> or, or, or uh, more mysterious, I should say, in a way. Uh, a more classical, more Virgilian context. So mm. Ulysses is not really that bad, as it turns out. It's just that uh, if we read it carefully, uh, okay, you were, you were in trouble, but now there is a way to fix that. Mm -hmm. Well, <coughs> talking about uh, redemption of characters, mm. one step lower into hell, Dante mm -hmm. meets a character that... Mm -hmm. Just this mention alone, I think, has cast him into a lot of trouble for about mm. one billion people living mm. in the world. Mm. Mm. He we, is in Canto, um, he's in Canto 28, and... Mohammed. Yes, I, I was about to say it <laughs> with more suspense, yes. but uh, mm. once you say, yeah, so... Maometto. Yes. And he finds mm. Muhammad, the prophet, in hell. And he and it's the only point in the Divine Comedy, and you can mm -hmm. please correct me if you think that I'm wrong, mm. but for me, mm. it's the only point of it where Dante gets a little vulgar with his character. And he reads this. He presents mm. this Muhammad as cut in half, sliced in half, ripped out. And he says... No cask ever gapes so wide for loss of mid or side stave as the soul I saw, cleft from the chin right down to where men fart. Between the legs, the entrails dangled, I saw the innards and the loathsome sack that turns what one has swallowed into mm. shit. Mm. And then, of course, we have, while I was caught up in the sight of him, he looked at me with his hands ripped apart his chest, saying, see how I rend myself, see how mangled is Mohammed. And I, I guess just reading that for many of our listeners who might be uh, of the Muslim conviction, that, that that alone is a little bit too much, this image of Mohammed. Right? So, so, so much for not... Um we're not being allowed to represent him. Uh, so what's the relationship of Dante with the Islamic world? Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, in this in this particular scene, um, you know, one one could partially say, and this is a partial element. You know, uh, he has no problem uh, attacking this person, this appearance, because he's writing in a Christian world, so he could care less. Uh, about <laughs> repercussions, um, and the the reader, the average e reader, obviously is not going to be a Muslim. Um, there probably won't be any Muslims at all reading his uh, commedia. It's going to be Christians who will enjoy that, who they will revel in reading of this horrible guy who had really nothing to say, and who is speaking rubbish. Now, as it turns out, he could care less about Muhammad, frankly. He has no interest in attacking Muhammad. Zero interest. What he has an issue with is a certain tendency among Christian authorities to behave 
like this guy, like this caricature. And what is going on here? Note that he does not speak to Muhammad in person. Okay? Yes, so he's not following that, that rule of redemption. He No, he's not carrying on Muhammad's lessons or, or, or mission or mandate in the least. In the least. Virgil speaks to him. And Virgil, when Virgil speaks to him, he neutralizes him. He uh, mesmerizes him. He uses magic, poetic magic, to shut him up. Mm -hmm. The guy is stunned by magic. Can you believe it? The prophet of divine lo um, law, the prophet of divine law, that has abolished and or threatens to abolish philosophy, and of course that has the the most visceral of visceral of hate against magic, is duped by magic, mm -hmm. poetic magic, ironic. The irony. Uh, so he is neutralized. Yes, any objection, the the the, the, the lofty. He represents the loftiest objection to philosophy at the very bottom of philosophy we have the magus magus is the the wise man the um, sophist so uh, the sophist in in in, the, in not in in a bad sense in the sense that he is for sophia he's a student of sophia uh, of wisdom and again, the Magus, the three wise men in Christianity, that story redeems magic. They are, you know, they're magicians in, in, in the original sense of the term. It redeems them because the story of the three wise men shows us that um, the star they're following, and so the, you know, the, the, the whole... Um, the study stars, of the stars that they were studying yes, these, point, these Zoroastrian yes, point, these Zoroastrian yes, priests them too. essentially yes, which carry yes, an entire civilization of Persia that has perfected the observation of the stars these stars yes, ultimately point so. to Jesus well they point to the human level the, mm. the, the real star is on the level of humanity it is not in the sky so these stars point the truth about the stars. They point to a truth, and this truth is a human truth. Mm -hmm. So that is redeemable. Sophistry in the original sense, in other words, the love of the stars, um, the love of heavenly wisdom, or natural philosophy in Aristotle's terms, is redeemable in the human context, on a human level. Or to put it with Cicero, Socrates um, brings the ideas from the sky into the polis. Mm -hmm. Well, right, 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 right. Fascinating. And and moving on, moving downwards, down defines himself to the core of hell, which in a very uh, beautiful uh, image is not hot but cold. The core mm -hmm. of hell is frozen. And mm -hmm. There's a frozen floor, uh, mm -hmm. big expansion. We imagine football fields just mm -hmm. frozen, and the heads and limbs of people who have been uh, well overdetermined in your example uh, are frozen mm. there. And at the center mm. of the centers, he finds this monster, which you mm -hmm. correctly said is not named as Lucifer. His name is Belzebub, who's the devil. And Dante gives an an, an image, uh, uh, Satan. Or, yes, of this. Uh, <laughs> he said, uh, "Oh, what a wonder it appeared to me when I perceived three faces on his head. The first, in front, was red mm. in color. Another mm. two he had, each joined with this. Above the midpoint of each shoulder, and all the three united at the crest. The one on the right was a whitish yellow." while the left-hand one was tinted like the people living at the sources of the Nile. 
So we're given this image of red, white, black, which is a very, very recurrent image in 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 mystical texts, correct? Mm. Mm. Yes. And then he continues, he said, uh, beneath each face two mighty wings emerged, such a, as befit so vast a bird. I never saw such massive sails at sea. So they're mm. larger than ships. They mm. were featherless and fashioned like a bat's wings. When he flapped them, he sent forth three separate winds, one for each face, I guess. The sources mm. of the ice upon Coctus, out of six eyes he wept, and his three chins dripped tears and drooled blood-red saliva. With his teeth, just like a hackle pounding flax, he chomped a sinner in each mouth, tormenting three at once. Mm -hmm. And in the center, you know, Dante says, the soul up there who bears the greatest pain, said the master, is Judas Iscariot, who has yes. his head within and outside flails his legs. A paradigm. So here we have the image, the, la the final image, the, the great betrayer of heaven, punishing the great betrayer of earth, uh, the, the great mm. betrayer Beelzebub punishing Judas mm -hmm. who betrayed Jesus. That, that's mm -hmm. like the mm -hmm. final mm -hmm. image that we saw. Right? So it's Paradigms of betrayal. Yeah, so, so there we have betrayal as the, the, the ultimate sin, the root Pretty of sure. all evil, right? Yes, well, that's, that's the worst, um, what, what ultimately all evil is about. Is betrayal. is a betrayal, betrayal of the good, betrayal of the good, it, and that's that's that 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 is a genuinely horrible thing. The only thing is that Dante is fairly detached ultimately as a poet, and he is not going to let him. You know, he doesn't indulge in. He's not a sentimental poet. He doesn't indulge in. You know, weeping at the face of the, he's not impressed by this monster but he's not impressed by um the evil of men yeah huh? no no he's he's very yes like you said he's very detached uh yeah. uh yes. up, 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 apart from a moment perhaps that we we might mention in a future uh we might mention in a future um uh, episode in uh, purgatory where he finally meets Beatrice but that's f mm. that that's from another show but at that moment like how can I was thinking about this a lot and thinking about mm. our discussions mm. like it feels like this world we're going through especially as of last year has some resemblance to that Dantean inferno mm -hmm. uh, not because mm -hmm. we're being tortured I mean if anything you know a lot are still very comfortable in 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 relative terms to how humanity has lived mm. you know uh, just sitting indoors with the internet and ordering pizza does not seem <laughs> that much of a punishment but i mm. feel there is this reversal this this betrayal of truth that is around us what do you think about this well the, the pizza doesn't pay for itself yes oh that's a good um, point <laughs> the uh well, there is flattery, there is seduction in all tyrannical enterprises. We are forced tyrants. Uh, we are seduced into the antithesis of freedom, mistaking it for freedom itself. When the tyrant approaches us, he tells us, look, here is a place where you will be free, and I will give you this place. I'm giving you a determination where you can be free. And then you enter, and it turns out to be a cage. Mm. You have paid for your cage by giving up on the challenge of freedom, what I've called elsewhere in an article, the challenge of freedom. You have given up on that. That challenge of freedom is none other than the path of virtue as understood 
by Dante. The challenge of freedom is the life facing indetermination on an everyday um, yeah, plane. Now, the betrayers here, the betrayers of the good, if we go back to the proposition that everything here is a, to be read in a poetic context, these paradigms, yeah, mm -hmm. you see them as if painted. The guy is not moving. He's mm -hmm. holding this as if, you know, we see these painters uh, of the Renaissance who pick up on this and they show this monster. He's not moving, but we see it as a paradigm, mm. as a model, uh, as a painting, still, immutable. Yeah, one thing, as to a notice, warning. one thing to notice is that for all his alleged powers, you know, this devil in Dante is pretty, seems pretty stuck himself. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. That is the condition um, we end up in. We are all stuck at the end. Uh, let me give you a reference uh, to a film, movie that you know, anybody can have access to. That is uh, Fellini's Satyricon. Satyricon is, of course, a Roman uh, it's like a representation masterwork. Of a yes, Roman we have fragments orgy. of it. Yes, I mean, it, it's decadence and it's, it's a satire. Of, of Roman decades. And, and just to mention that Fellini, not, not many people know that, he was deeply influenced by Dante in ways that are yeah. very, very subtle to notice. In, uh, yeah. uh, you know, I mean, Dolce Vita yeah. is uh, a line from Dante. Yes, yes. Um, you know, what, what, what decent Italian um, has not studied him a bit? <laughs> True. Um, and now, there's something... Um, that is very striking about the Satyricon in uh, Fellini. Fellini is showing us a journey. And again, as Dante goes through all of these imageries from classical antiquity, including the Minotaur, and he sh this is a journey of a descent into hell. It is a journey of perversion. It is a journey of betrayal. The protagonists are faced with choices, and as they go along, they systematically make the wrong choice. They betray the slightest possibility of the good. And as they advance downward, spiral downward, I should say, they become worse and worse. Um, their situation becomes ever more dire. Finally, mm. they end up with the most treacherous, the most vile of choices. What happens to them at last? They end up prophetically, this is a prophetic image for everyone, they end up by disappearing onto images that are painted on fragments of architecture, walls. They are as ghosts. They are mere images in the, imagi in the imagination, in the, in the memory. Huh? They slide into the past and we see mere vestiges of them, suggesting that they had never really lived. They had betrayal, betrayed life itself by becoming no more than shadows. Mm -mm. Uh, again, is this image of uh, archetypal possession, uh, you know, when a certain compulsion comes over you, you you become that thing. You lose yourself. You be, you be, uh -huh. you become lost. You become violent. You become this archetype until nothing is left of you. Well, they they wanted to find their place. They wanted to be determined. They wanted the safety 
of serfdom without recognizing that it was serfdom. And they found it. They yeah, found it. And, and, and there is an increasing uh, desire for safety uh, in our world uh, at the expense of well, all freedom. Safety from what? In reality, in Dante's terms, these um, people who deserved to be in hell, not the ones he speaks to, but the, the ones who are there and uh, are properly there, have renounced, attacked, and finally betrayed virtue. Mm -hmm. They have opted for a cage, a determination, and that has bereft them of mind. The further down you go, the more you become mere flesh, soulless flesh, a marionette, a zombie, you might say, but who is stuck in his own place without thought. This Belzebu is utterly mindless. Mm. He has, he is the, 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 the prototype or the paradigm of a man who is mere flesh. This flesh has become a monster. Why is it a monster? Because it has no mind. Mm -hmm. And it, it presupposes, it entails a betrayal because we're not born that way. We're born to flourish um, spiritually. And that entails the, the rise of the mind as proper guide of the body. Here, the mind has been reduced to a piece of meat. It is spoken of by, by the authorities, the tyrannical authorities, as a piece of meat. The mind, how dare it try to rise above the level of the flesh? Don't we know today, to cast it in contemporary terms, don't we know today that the mind is but a bunch of neurons? Exactly, uh, yes. Uh, that that are just bumping into each other in response to outer compulsions. That's so, over determination, right? I have that, that that is absolute uh, determination. The freezing, the, mind, the freezing. We have abolished by definition. We have redefined the human. We have defined him against not only classical antiquity, the poetry of classical antiquity, but against certainly Christian theology. We have abolished freedom by defining the human being as an absolutely determined piece of meat. And there we are stuck, of course, listening to the authorities that cater to that crowd of people who have abandoned their humanity for the sake of defining themselves, of for the sake of the security that these new definitions give us, provide us with. Mm, They're yeah. defining it's, us. It's, it's, where it's where no, am I? Where am I? Yes. Here you are, they tell you. Here you are. You're a piece of yes, flesh. Yes. In, in, and now in you follow the yeah, protocols. Yes. You don't need to f face the challenge of freedom. You just follow the protocols. Mm, 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 mm. Yeah. And it's no surprise that I heard that, you know, Sam Harris, who's the arch... Um, uh, definer, determiner uh, in the materialist sense uh, was also very, very, uh, you know, pro the lockdowns and the medical procedures and uh, strangely critical of people who j were just skeptical. You know, this great skeptic, mm. as he self, mm -hmm. self uh, calls himself, mm. Uh, mm -hmm. was very critical of some very, very well known and very rational skeptics of what's going on, mm. you know, who just mm. question it. They, they, they don't say, go down the street and start right. You know, they, they just say, mm -hmm. look at the data. Perhaps the data is worrying as to the medical procedures, as to the law. In, in Sam Harris's yes. art. So, but there is a connection there. Like you said, you know, it's this, well, I think what's going on from what you said, I, I take it is this great opportunity for these determiners to, to, to complete what they see as a task, the, the ultimate kind of freezing, determining us as mere meat uh, that has to be preserved at all costs? Well, alas, we are raised that way. Schools teach that. 
Um, yeah, for sure, for sure. But there's, you know? a, and uh, the, you know, there's a, to perhaps to end with a ray of hope. Um, <laughs> it's it's very interesting to me how you know Dante at this point, uh, be because uh, there's not much more. Uh, that's a funny thing, you know. He confronts this monster. Perhaps people listening are waiting for this, I don't know, big clash of, of. <laughs> with, but but there's nothing to clash with. It, it, no. There there he no. is, Belzebub, fr- fr- frozen, no. and that's it. No. They, he can't do anything. You can't. You d- don't no. need to do much. And Dante um, just goes through hell. The, this is a, a a very interesting image. He doesn't. I mean, you know, it would be quite a task to just retract the whole way back. But he's at the center of hell, and you're wondering how is he going to get out? And he just goes through hell. And by through hell, I mean there's this strange image image of reversal so you know there he is he looks at Beelzebub who is just from the waist up protruding from the ice in the image that I just recounted Mm -hmm. and Mm -hmm. at some point something happens and Dante sees the other half the two legs sticking out as if this whole world has flipped upside down but Mm -hmm. this time he realizes that's the correct uh, that's the yeah. correct direction because as Beelzebub fell from above, he got stuck head first. He plunged, mm-hmm. and so the quote unquote normal rose. normal way to see him is with his legs up. But that only happens at the end of hell. It's almost like at the end of Inferno, you have this reversal back to how things should be, right? Mm-hmm. And there, the whole canto ends uh, in the way all the books of the Divine Comedy, the last word is strella is star mm. right mm, mm, mm-hmm. um, notice that uh, this end this consummation as it were of, of the inferno the descent uh, is again anticipated in canto one where again he d- he ha- cannot tell us well yeah uh, how he entered into this world, the mm. world of, of this, this stage that he is setting up, through what point he fell asleep in it. Now this point is a point is a determination, and this point will reappear throughout the various uh, the, the realms. And even in Paradiso, where there is this crucial image of the circle and the point. And at the end of Paradiso, Dante will try to commensurate the two. How do you commensurate? How do you tie together the point, the determined, the determination, and the undetermined, the circle? In um, Renaissance terms, you you see this image of the Vitruvius man, right, by, by Leonardo. The human being ties somehow, is the link, yes, between the square and the circle. The square is determination, the earth. Um, the circle, the sky, the heavens, is the undetermined. The human being is the link between the two. Dante cannot tell us at the beginning of the Commedia, of Inferno, how he got through this point, from this point, into this world. Now he tells us, however, how he, through what point, he comes out of it. Mm. Okay. And he has a very good description of it. <laughs> and yeah. Yeah, there is this, so Belzebu, again, is this Satan, the ultimate determination is a kind of point through which, and it's open, it's an open passage, it's a door, it, it constitutes a door, and through this door he slides very easily, because it's all icy, right? He slides. Where does he slide? He slides outward to face the heavens. Mm-hmm. He doesn't achieve the heavens, he faces the heavens. So he regains dignity and certainly legitimacy de facto for, well, again, 
who contemplates the stars? Of course, the philosophers, the magi, the, the magicians, these uh, contemplators of the heavens. There you have it. He has restored us to that mission, to that journey. How did he do that? Well, that was the whole point of Inferno. He mm. comes in, and he can't tell us at the beginning how he got through in that underworld where that that life is banned, but he can get us out of that inferno of determinations, out of determination to face the undeterminate. And by facing the undeterminate, regaining strength, the strength of the poet, the strength is the virtue of the poet who mm. can pierce appearances that determine and expose them to the undetermined, mm, mm, mm. to infinity. Wow. Expose everything, that we, all these certainties that we are fed, expose them to infinity itself. That, that's explosive. That is explosive. Yes, and that's a great point to, to conclude this discussion. Um, I want to thank you Fair. again for being here with us. My good pleasure. And uh, just make, uh, you know, uh, just throw throw a, a, a stone in the future so we can chase it and at some point try to move up the mountain of the unsinning purgatory and and uh, Paradiso, but uh, that was quite a journey. Uh, these these two these two discussions. So thank you very much once again. And uh, you know, I will, I'll put any links that you want underneath. And uh, hope we'll have these discussions again. Very well, very well. Providence is with us. Providence is with us. Farewell. Bye bye.